Welcome, everybody, to Sheridan Report on the Gruley True Sports Network. Sheridan Report is brought to you by MyBookie.ag. To get up to 100% cash back bonus on your first deposit up to $300, make sure you go to MyBookie.ag and use the promo code TGT100. You can also make it easier on yourself. Go to thegruelytruth.com, click on the MyBookie.ag banner at the top of the page. I am your co-host for the Sheridan Report, Mike Goodpaster. Right now, I want to welcome in the owner, the founder, the grand poobah of the Sheridan Report, Bobby Sheridan. How you doing, Bobby? I like that a lot, the grand poobah. I haven't heard that in a long time, and I'll take it. I haven't heard I it guess. since the Flintstones, and, I think. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And, uh, you know, Mike, I'm doing great. Uh, really happy with the Toronto win last night. It really pleased me a lot. And, and, our, and you know, baseball, look, when the favorites are going to go 14-10, and 10, over the last two days, which is 58%, which is the norm for baseball, and not 63 and 17, which is not the norm, that means we're going to be making a lot of money. So I'm happy that we're on a trend now that I think I think uh, June is going to be a huge month for us in, in baseball, and so I'm really pleased and, and anticipating that. And, you know, Mike, your St. Louis Blues won the game last night as you predicted, I think you said four to one. It was yeah, five missed. to one. I screwed it you up. missed it by a darn goal. But I'll tell you, that was an important goal because five and a half was the total. Yeah. So, you know, it went from a blues under four to one to a blues over five to one. Those that parlay those type of things. But if you use it in a mix and match or with any of the top plays, you're a winner yesterday because all the top plays won three, and know, oh, and the mix and match two of those three won. So, Hey, we're good, Mike. And, I think even though there's no hockey or basketball, I do want to mention two things today before we talk about baseball, and then that'll be our sports wagering day. But there's some good stuff today, so hang in, fans. Um, game five is tomorrow night, and we'll have our selection on air tomorrow. And just so for the fans that don't follow it but just listen to it here, the Bucks are minus seven as we move back to Milwaukee. So there's the – full 10 points from game three's line but only four points from game four's line where they totally made the, the adjustment that helped get us on the winner yesterday so it's going to be interesting tomorrow night as we really handicap this game very very heavily today as to whether we take the value and the seven points can that transfer on the road and, and play big in Milwaukee or is this going to be a total home series where the home team kind of dominates. So it'll be interesting to see what we come up with, but I'm anticipating that game. And then, Mike, your hockey, we've got that series. I looked it up, and I don't follow it. You do. But that series starts Monday. Yeah, so and three, my Bruins are a plus yeah. 145, or my Blues are a plus 145. Yeah, Mike, I was going to ask you what that line was. So, okay, so plus 145. So there, we're going to have some things to talk about there. Um, that's going to be fun. And uh, did you see the reaction of the Blues fans last night that was watching that? That they've really got a good, you know a good spirit going on there in St. Louis. They want this bad. I, you said something on air. They haven't had one since when? 1970 is the last time they went to the Stanley Cup. They've never won a Stanley Cup final. And as soon as January, they were the worst team in the NHL. Oh my! Wow. This reminds me, Mike. What, 2002, the Angels. Won it there. They're they're only their first and only one. And you know the Angels as a franchise had some really good teams in the late seventies, eighties. You know, and they finally got one, and that was amazing. And uh, that seventeen years ago, my kids were young, and we took them to the parade and everything. It was a big deal. And St. Louis might be getting it this year. You know that type of thing. Worst team in January, and all of a sudden you're in the finals. So. That's going to be really fun to talk about, too, Mike. All right, Bobby. You so want are we to ready start for off baseball? with the MLB? All right, here we go. Uh, we got the mix and match portion of our of our card, and that's three favorites that are valued favorites that we kind of hook together and make one parlay out of it. Now, that particular parlay, those these three teams we've given you, has not been a winning combination. But the two out of three has been two out of these three have hit 
24 or 25 times in the last 33 days. At no time have we hit none of these. And then we swept, uh, we hit, we swept maybe four times, which is not a good percentage I'm proud of, but we're hitting two out of three is an inordinate amount of time. So the, the three of those that I'm going to give out today are the Rockies at 405, the Red Sox at 407, and the Twins at 607. And the Rockies, you know, we talk about aces and what they do for you as a team. Armand Marquez went on there yesterday and pitched a wonderful ball game in Pittsburgh. He outdueled Archer, and, and Colorado scored five, and there's a win. Well, what does that do? What does an ace do for you? It sets you up, stops losing streaks, it, it rests bullpen, it reestablishes things, and that's a big win that he gave, and now he's going to hand the ball to another strong right-hander, John Gray. I think he's going to get the job done over a guy making – kind of an opener type start today. So is the opener going to prevail or, or Gray? And I, I'm going to go with Colorado there off of Herman, off of Herman or Marquez's effort yesterday to propel them. And then we've got um, Boston. That's Rick Porcello facing Sanchez. I think there's going to be a run, some run score. We, we often get some viewer or listener uh, fan stuff that's in about totals. This is a total that I like over. Uh, I like the Boston over combination in this game. I think they're going to swing the bats really well. And Parcello should win that matchup with Sanchez. And then we finish it with Martin Perez, and we talk about aces. Aces also finish off series. You know, it's hard to sweep a team on the road, but when you're the best team in the league, such as Minnesota Twins, and you've got an ace on the road in the final of a series, such as the Twins do tonight, I think Minnesota will get that sweep tonight over an inconsistent starting pitcher Harvey and an inconsistent Angel offense. And let me give the fans a little tip here. The Angels are 5-14 and 14 against left-handed starting pitchers. So Minnesota Twins are a good mix and match tonight. Now we go to our, our straight plays, and we've got four again, and we have no problem giving handing out four when we've got our percentages the way we want them because we're able to isolate the dogs better than most. And so let's give you – uh, two of our dogs are off the bat here. It's Arizona plus a dollar twenty at twelve forty. That's a an afternoon start, and the only one. That's Merrill Kelly versus Derek Lauer. These are both starters making their third starts against their respective teams. Both struggled uh, in in starts, so this could be an over in a daytime game in San Diego. But but both pitchers control, especially Kelly's control, has improved quite a bit. So. I expect the Diamondbacks to avoid the sweep today. I did not think they'd be swept in this series. And San Diego has a chance to do that today, but I like Kelly and the price. And then we, we scroll down and we get another really good price here. This is a playoff-type matchup, the Phillies and the Cubs. The, if you've watched any part of this series, that's the type of feeling you get watching these two teams battle. And, you know, it's 1-1 as we go to this game here, and you've got a battle of left-handers. Cole Irvin, a rookie whom the Cubs have not seen. And that's dangerous sometimes for teams when they have not seen a pitcher. It takes them at least one time around. It's not as dangerous with the analytics and the video that they, these guys use now, but still it's difficult to see a pitcher the first time. Versus Cole Hamill, who, what is this, year 15? I'm sure that m- many of the Philadelphia hitters have faced him multiple times. So I think the plus 160 in a series rubber game here. I favor Philadelphia. So, okay, we go to the top plays, and we've got uh, the Miami Marlins. And don't look now. They've won four in a row, guys. Four in a row. And they go on the road yesterday, and they open up that series. And we like that pitching matchup. We said Caleb Smith, an all-star. There's a, there's an ace who got them on. He got that road trip started off right. And look what these aces do for you, Mike. You hand the ball now to Urania, who his last two starts are excellent. Used to be he couldn't pitch on the road. Well, now he's pitching on the road, doing well. And Detroit, it's a fade. You know, Detroit is is one of the worst teams in baseball right now. And I think Miami has another good, solid matchup there. And then you've got the Giants who, you know, what a win last night was for them. A nice comeback win, and 
they're going to hand the ball to Samarja, who we talked about it last time. If he gets out of the first inning, his ERA is in the ones. And then you turn the ball over to a bullpen who's top five in, in the league. So get out of the first inning, give up a run through six. Now you've got the advantage, the Giants bullpen over the Braves bullpen, and that's what won the game last night. So let's get the ball to the bullpen with the lead. Now Max Fried isn't going to be no easy task. But he's a young guy, and these guys sometimes don't they don't put put it all together. There's certain games that don't come together for them, and this might be one. We bet against him last time, and he beat us, and we're going to bet against him again. Got a nice home dog price there. So, like the Giants, right back, Mike. Take two out of three there, and game four is tomorrow. So that is a four-game series that we'll, we'll finish tomorrow. But I think they'll take this game tonight. So there's your baseball, Mike. Nice, solid slate of games. We gave you the top three yesterday, and they were 3-0. I'm going to give you the top three today. This includes some mixes and matches. So just as an over, an overview, the Phillies were listed as a top play, not the Giants. The Phillies, the Marlins, and then the Twins would be the top three games in MLB. All right, Bobby. What have we got for on this day? Okay, on this day, Mike, uh, do another boxing one. I love to talk boxing with you. It's my favorite thing to listen to you talk about. And that's, uh, we have a 1993, we have Riddick Bowe, TKO's Jesse Ferguson. Now, I've never heard of Jesse Ferguson. I have heard of Riddick Bowe. And he beat him on this day in two rounds for the heavyweight title. Yeah, and Riddick Bowe was one of the most decorated amateur boxers in U.S. history. Um, he was one of 13 children, so he was fighting from the time he got out. Um, 1988 Seoul Olympics. A lot of people look back, and you've heard of Lennox Lewis. Lewis didn't fight Bowe when they were pros. People claim that Bowe was afraid because he got his ass whooped by Lewis. But when you look at the gold medal match, Bo had a dominant first round, landing 33 of 94 punches. Lewis landed 17 of, or 14 of 67, so Bo wins the first round. Um, now, in the first round, the referee, who was an East German, gave Bo two cautions for headbutts and deducted a point for a third headbutt. The replays, when you watch the fight, clearly show there was never any headbutts. Commentator Ferdy Pacheco disagreed with the deduction, saying they didn't hit heads. And then in the second round, the referee, Lewis hit Bo hard, didn't even seem to really stun him, though, and he ended up giving Bo two standing eight counts, waved the fight off after the third, and basically Lennox Lewis was your gold medalist. Bo was relegated to the silver. Now, they turned pro, and Riddick Bo's biggest, worst enemy was always himself. He would come in out of shape a lot of times. Then he would come in in shape, and he would look great. And in November of 90, 1992, he fought the reigning heavyweight champion at Vander Holyfield for the undisputed title. And people still question his heart and his dedication because he had a tendency to come in overweight, seemed disinterested. And he basically quieted all those doubts. And it was one of the greatest, one of the most brutal fights in heavyweight championship history. He ended up winning a decision. And then a few weeks later, he threw one of his belts, I think it was a WBC belt, in a trash can and refused to fight Lennox Lewis. Um, basically, Rock Newman was Riddick Bowe's manager. Rock Newman was a dipshit, but he said that the proposal on a $32 million purse for Bo to fight Lewis, they said that, he said that HBO should be offering 90 to 10 split in Bo's favor which, of course, is absurd. They ended up not fighting. So he ends up, he makes a couple title defenses against guys that were past their prime. One was Michael Dokes, who he knocked out, I think, in the first round. And then his next fight, he fought at RFK Stadium in Washington, D.C. against Jesse, the body snatcher, Ferguson. Ferguson was a guy who was a good fighter. Um, he was past his prime. Bo stops him in the second round. Ferguson's main claim to fame was he got knocked out by Mike Tyson in 1985 or 86 on Wide World Sports ABC. Got hit with an uppercut. Oh. And after the fight, they interviewed Tyson about it. And Tyson said he was disappointed because he wanted to slam his nose all the way into his brain because Mike Tyson was such a nice guy. Um, but then... 
Bo goes on after those two defenses, and he comes in overweight to fight Evander Holyfield. He entered the ring at 246 pounds, or 266 pounds. He weighed in at 246, so he put on 20 pounds in the 24 hours between the weigh-in and the fight. He was actually, the 246 was 11 pounds over the first time he fought Holyfield. And this was another great fight. And this is the fight that was bizarre because you had a guy by the name of James Fanman Miller who dropped into the open-air arena. I think it was at Caesars Palace, Las Vegas. He landed into the ropes in Bo's corner, and a surreal scene kind of delayed the fight. And the surreal scene was all these guys, back then, if you remember, the cell phones were like these huge things, and Bo's security and cornermen were just beating the shit out of this guy. <laughs> I mean, they beat him senseless. Of course, he already was to jump in like that. And <laughs> after that, Bo comes back, wins a couple fights. He gets a third fight against Evander Holyfield, of course. And in the third fight, it was... Oh, that's... Oh, sorry about that, guys. That's that's Riddick Bo calling right now. He's probably going to give me crap about it. <laughs> it. It really is, by the way. But um, that or, that or it's it I can't get him to come on the show, though, because he wants like $5,000 to be on the show. But he talks to me on the phone without a problem. <laughs> but... Hey, Mike, we, that could be Pfizer calling, you know. It could be Pfizer because they don't like me now. Um, Big but, Pharma? <laughs> yeah, listen to Survive in Advance because our Facebook page, we can't share anything for a week now because I said something bad about Big Pharma and Pfizer and Facebook didn't like it. So go find a Survive in Advance from earlier today about the NFL and legalizing marijuana and share the shit out of it. Um, and I hope you don't get banned. But Bo fights a third fight against Holyfield. Another epic fight. Holyfield actually dropped him during the fight. But Mo, Bo came back, ended up stopping Holyfield, I think in like the eighth round. And then Bo, who seemed like crazy shit, just was kind of drawn to him like a fly to shit. He fights Andrew Golot at Madison Square Garden. Again, Bo had a weight issue. And Golotta was better than people thought. And Golotta actually beat the hell out of him, but he kept hitting him low. And then finally, he gets disqualified for hitting Bo low. And I mean, by low, I mean he was hitting him into testicles, and he did it repeatedly, even though he was winning a fight. He was disqualified. Once again, Bo's entourage rushes the ring, and they attack Golotta with two way radios. And, I mean, they beat the hell out of him. They ended up putting 11 stitches in him. They even assaulted Galata's 74-year-old trainer, Lou Duba, who collapsed in the ring, was taken out of the garden on a stretcher. But if you listen to me talk to guys that, you know, trained with Lou Duba and were managed by Lou Duba, yeah. karma's a bitch for Lou Duba. Um, and then <laughs> the thing that was a bitch was the entourage began rioting, fighting with spectators, staff, policemen, and I remember Jim Lampley and George Foreman, who were doing the fight for HBO, actually hiding, and Larry Merchant actually hiding under the ring while this was going on. And the interesting story there was Jim Lampley's daughter was actually in the crowd. So he's hiding underneath the ring apron, and then he realizes, my daughter's in here. And he jumps out with Foreman. They're looking for his daughter, and it was just, it was a complete mess. And then... The thing that got weirder, weirder about Bo was he decided to join the Marines. And he joined the Marine Corps, and I can't remember, I think it was like in 1997. He went to Paris Island. This is after the Galata fights. He actually, he won the second fight with Galata also. Galata was in the fight. It was a great fight. And it gets stopped because of Galata, Galata for some reason, when shit got tough, you know, he's punching him in the nuts and everything, and they finally stopped the fight. Now, with Galata, he fought a guy that by the name of Samson Pua, uh, and this was before the fight before he fought Riddick Bo. And he'd always had it easy, and Pua was a big dude that gave him trouble, and he actually bit Pua during that fight on the neck, but they didn't do anything about it. So, and later on, he would fight Mike Tyson and basically lose his shit again and quit in the middle of the ring there. So the guy was not all there in the head. But Bo arrived at the Marine Corps recruiting base in Paris Island, February 10th, 1997. On his first day of recruit training, 
Bo discussed leaving the Corps with Marine commanders and quit after three days of heavy physical training with his platoon in Paris Island. He couldn't handle that. That was in 1997. Um, 1998, we get into it. And this is where you find a boxer with dementia. And I have talked to Riddick Bo over the last two years a few times. He slurs his words really bad. Really nice guy, but I don't think he really knows where he's at anymore. And he was convicted in February of 1998 of kidnapping his estranged wife, Judy, and their five children, thinking it would reconcile his marriage. Bo's wife, or Bo went to his wife, Cornelius, North Carolina home, which is where they live, and threatened her with knife, handcuffs, duct tape, pepper spray. He forced her and their children into a vehicle and set out for his home in Maryland. During the kidnapping, Bo stabbed his wife in the chest. Police captured Bo in, I think it was like South Hill, Virginia, somewhere in Virginia, and they freed his family. Bo agreed to a plea bargain of guilty to interstate domestic violence and was sentenced 18 to 24 months in prison. Despite the agreed sentence on February 29, 2000, the judge sentenced, and this, he stabbed his wife in the chest and abducted them all, but the judge commuted a sentence to only 30 days due to claim of brain damage by Bo's defense. This sentence, which if he's got brain damage that bad, it makes you wonder why he would even be let out of anything. But this sentence, countered at a plea agreement, was later overturned, and Bo ended up serving 17 months in federal prison. He was arrested again after getting out of jail February, I think it was February or March of 2001, after a domestic dispute with his new wife, and Bo allegedly dragged his new wife and left her with cuts on her knees and elbows. Now, in 2013, to make things even more interesting or crazy, however you look at it, Riddick Bo announced his intention to start training to be a professional wrestler. He was to make his de- debut over in the UK on something called Preston City Wrestling, but they had a disagreement with Bo and his new agent, so he ended up not doing it. But the story of Riddick Bo is a, is a man that was 43 and 1 who went through many wars, and in the end, those wars got him, and his life was crazy in and out of the ring. And that's all I got to say about Riddick Bo. You know, Mike, I didn't know most of what you just told me. I'd never heard of Ferguson, but that's you know what got us on Riddick Bo, which is the real story here. And that's unbelievable. And now let me ask you a question. Was he... Could he have been around the right people? Could we be talking about one of the best heavyweight fighters of all time? I, I think this, it was in his head. He was one of the best heavyweight fighters. If you go watch him in 1992, I think it was in November, fight Evander Holyfield. On that night, he was as good as almost anybody that was ever in the ring. He was a big, strong dude, had a long reach, had a hell of a jab. His problem was he didn't have dedication even in the amateurs. And I think the problem was... And this is the thing, because when you look at guys that have the pugilistic dementia or have issues like that, it usually comes back to whether it's their diet or the yo-yoing of weight. I think it intensifies and makes it even worse in their brain. Because if you look at guys who have dementia outside of football, if they were guys, a lot of times they were guys that didn't take care of their body. The same thing with boxers you know, heavy drinkers, stuff like that, because that doesn't help your brain either. And then you throw all the blows into it on top of that. But Riddick Bo, I think, if he would have dedicated himself as an amateur, I think he would have dominated the 90s. This is a man that beat Evander Holyfield two out of three. That's the same Evander Holyfield that crushed Mike Tyson twice. And he was from Brownstown, New York, just like, you know, Mike Tyson was. And if you look at Riddick Bo. He's similar, the way he fought was real similar to James Buster Douglas, only I think he was even better than the way James Buster Douglas did it, but Buster had the same problem where his weight would go up, his weight would come down, and they just didn't take things seriously. Now, Buster Douglas, that February 24th or February 20th, 1990 in Japan, he took things seriously, and he showed how great a fighter he could have been. The same thing with Riddick Bowe when he fought Evander Holyfield on that November night in 1992. The problem was, for that one night, they were special. All the other nights, they were their own worst enemy. Well, yeah, and it sounds like in his life, he was his own worst enemy. And 
couldn't have anybody around him that maybe was got him the help he needed mentally or well, and I can track, tell you this. You know? I, I've talked to him before. He's he's a really nice guy. But whenever you have any kind of brain damage like that, it's like one time you're a nice guy and the next time you're an asshole. So, and, and the bad thing is, it's something he can't control. But the even worse thing is, I think if he had kept his ass in shape and taken everything seriously, I don't think he would be in the shape he's in today. Right. Wow, Mike. Riddick Bo. All right. So that, now I got another thing I got to do. I got to look up some Riddick Bo stuff. Watch Riddick Bo against Evander fights. Holyfield. All three fights. They're all three brutal. And he beat him twice? Yeah, he beat him by decision the first time. He lost the close decision in the second fight. And in the third fight, he actually stopped Holyfield after Holyfield knocked him down. But if you watch those fights and then watch guys like Deontay Wilder and Tyson Fury, you'll know why I'm always railing against them because those guys don't make a pimple on any of those guys' asses. Wow. Oh yeah. I mean what would Riddick what would any of those guys do with today's group? I mean it was it's not even and to see Showtime or HBO, whoever put that stat up about title defenses listing Wilder as nine and then on the same list of all these other, you know, legends, that that had to make you cringe as a boxer. Yeah, it's expert. stupid because he's not even a heavyweight champion. Nobody is right now. It's just three guys that look like right. they're pretty good that have some sort of claim, but they don't want to fight each other. So, And we will talk about that more tonight on Inside Boxing Weekly. And since it's the weekly show, that means John Einreinhofer will be on to defend his boy, Deontay Wilder. Which so should you know make what? it That's fun. That's the show we got to listen to. Yeah. Is that and a you, special time tonight? Is that 9 Eastern? Cause yeah, the weekly show Eastern, right? is always at 9 o'clock because John's a lawyer and he can't do it 11 at night because he's got to be in court the next day. So we'll be 9 o'clock tonight live on thegridleytruth.com or on Spreaker. And as always, you can send us any kind of questions, any kind of comments during the show on Spreaker. Or you can send the comments now. Or if you have any questions for me, Jeremiah or John, you can send them to a direct message or tweet to at Grueling Truth. I also want to re- bring up, if you like to bet on the horses, Phil Rankin. You can go halfway down on the gruelingtruth.com page, click on Phil Rankin's THG, the Handicapping Guide, um, click that banner. That will take you there, and he'll give you, I think it's $5 a day. You get four tracks. You get the multi-track special. And, of course, Bobby Sheridan. Go to the SheridanReport.com. You can get Bobby's top play of the day for $5. You can get Bobby's sheet for the entire day at $10. Or you can get the entire month at $50. Now, that entire month at $50, Bobby, does that include the top play of the day also? Oh, yeah. You get the whole report. It'll give you everything. Every It'll list the top play. It'll, it'll give you all the early risers. You know, the early risers are 5-0 and oh Monday and Tuesday, and they're 1-2 and two this morning. Yeah, and so if that's you don't know, the pick- early risers are the ATP, ATP Tennis Tour. Tennis Tour, and, and we, we handle it much like we do the baseball. That's our, we, you know, that's our uh, money line. We, we go, for, we, we get the value dog, and we give you the best ones. And so we're 6-2 and two, uh, this week with those. And then it includes PGA, which starts a new tournament tomorrow. And, you know, Mike, the, uh, I'm really happy with – with uh, you know how things are going right now with the, with the early risers and how baseball is gonna we're gonna have a big June and anybody that listens to me over the the months that I've been on the show I call it exactly as as I as it, as it's happening whether it's good bad and different and I'm really excited for the next month so let's get a let's get let's have a great day today and I know last night and yesterday was a great day for the listeners we've had a big week and and let's continue the, continue the momentum. All right, Bobby, and we will be back tomorrow at 2 o'clock with the Sheridan Report, noon with Survive in Advance, and tonight at 9 o'clock with Inside Boxing Daily. You can hear all of our shows on iTunes, iHeartRadio, Spotify, Spreaker, Stitcher, TuneIn, basically anywhere you find sports podcasts, you'll find The Grueling Truth. And don't forget to download the app on the iTunes Store. Just look at the Grueling Truth Sports Network. So, for Bobby Sheridan, I'm Mike Goodpaster. You've been listening to The Grueling Truth, where the legends speak.